Good afternoon, Hattiesburg. Thanks for joining us for this COVID-19 City News Briefing for Friday, January 29th. We will start with hospitalizations. Uh, as of this morning, we had 85 people who are in the hospital with COVID. And of those 85, 29 are in the ICU. That's between Merritt Health Wesley and Forest General. As you can see, we've come down from that spike. Uh, we got down as low as under 80 earlier this week, but back up to 85 right now. We, we hope that uh, that we can continue seeing that trend to go to work down in a downward trajectory so that we can uh, hopefully make some, some decisions in terms of uh, the next executive order uh, later next week. Statewide data today, 2,186 new cases, 38 new deaths. Unfortunately, there were two deaths since our last briefing, one in Forest County, one in Lamar County. We send our heartfelt condolences to those families. Totals to date now, COVID-related deaths, 127 in Forest County and 66 in Lamar County. New positive cases, there were 35 new cases in Forest County and 32 in Lamar County, which brings our totals, total infections in Forest County to 6,396, and Lamar County has seen 5,214. Our five-day average also, um, over time, has come down from that spike uh, in terms of the metro area, which was well over 100 in early January, down to about uh, around the 70 mark between both counties combined. Our inside 14-day number, this is the number of people who have received their positive test results in the last two weeks. This gives you an idea of how many active cases you could have in your community. Right now in Forest County, that number stands at 526, and in Lamar County, that number stands at 461. Kind of a similar story here. Uh, we, can, we got under 1,000 earlier this week for about four or five days, then went back up, but uh, today we're back under 1,000. So again, we hope this is part of a larger downward trajectory for this number. Compared to a week ago, Forest County had 515 inside 14 day, again, active cases potential, uh, up to 526 today, so around the same number. Lamar County, though, dropped a little over 20, so 483 to 461, and we're down 987, so a net decrease if you, if you factor the two counties together. Hospitalizations also down, down by 11 from a week ago, and then ICU emissions still under 30, but uh, up to 29 today. Our goals continue to be protecting the vulnerable, people over the age of 60, people with underlying or chronic health conditions. We also want to prevent overrun of the healthcare system by slowing the spread, understanding that uh, during the winter months, hospital capacity does get tight. Uh, however, as of this morning, uh, Forest General had a few acute beds available and a couple of ICU beds. Uh, Merritt Health Wesley had um, over 20 acute beds available. However, their ICU was full. And so uh, we have to continue keeping an eye on hospital capacity and overall infection numbers. And then, of course, prioritizing public health while keeping the private sector a space to operate is another goal. Uh, the four factors that drive our response as a community, the widespread availability of testing, wearing masks, watching our own data, and of course, listening to all voices. One of those voices, not only for our community, but for the entire state, is our state health officer of the Mississippi State Department of Health, Dr. Thomas Dobbs. Uh, Dr. Dobbs has been a trusted source of information and advice and, and consistently uh, good data-driven decision-making on his part uh, throughout this pandemic. And so yesterday he was, he was great enough to lend us a few minutes of his time to answer some questions that, that you submitted via Facebook and Instagram. And so right now we will play this interview, our conversation with Dr. Thomas Dobbs. We're glad today to have Dr. Thomas Dobbs, our state health officer, uh, and a longtime member of the public health community in Hattiesburg. And uh, first of all, big thank you for, for being here with us today. No, no. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for having me, and thanks for the great work y'all have done fighting COVID. And I um, want to thank you for the job that you're doing. I know that's you're you're one of the, the, the one of the few trusted, consistently trusted voices of just good, honest, and truthful information regarding COVID nineteen over the past ten months. And so, what we did today is we put out uh, a call for questions on Facebook and Instagram, and uh, we got a lot of questions. Uh, we're going to focus those questions just on the vaccine specifically today, and so. Uh, apologies to all the other folks who asked questions that were non-vaccine related. We'll try to get answers to those some other time. And so I know I have you for 10 minutes, so we're going to have 10 questions and um, we're going to kind of rapid fire and, and answer these as efficiently as you can. So, all right. So obviously getting a critical mass of people vaccinated is crucial to the state's recovery, both uh, economically and just getting us back to some semblance of normal. Um, I know in the past several weeks, we are averaging 30 to 40,000 total doses that the state is getting. Mm -hmm. And where do you see vaccine supply, specifically for Mississippi, going over the next weeks and months? And, and how will that affect the state's rollout plan? Yeah, so um, 
just as a quick overview, we get a steady supply every month, I mean, every week of vaccine. And so we kind of try to operate on real-time inventory. So um, we have it available, we order it as soon as we have it available and send it out to our locations. Of the approximately 40,000 doses a week that we get, 30,000 we go into the drive-through program around the state. And the additional amount is shared with clinical partners like the um, like Hattiesburg Clinic and Forest General, which they're doing you know, their efforts and also with Community Health Center uh, the um, the uh, Hattiesburg um, uh, Family Health Center. So we, we try to balance it out. Uh, as for the, as far as the future goes, we anticipate over the next couple of weeks about a 16% week on week difference of Moderna doses. And so we should be seeing a little bit more. The other thing is we have, have pulled back a little bit of the Pfizer doses from our long-term care program because they weren't using it. And so that'll be a, sort of like a one-time push of, you know, maybe about 9,000 doses of vaccine. So it's a little bit unpredictable, and I know that's kind of frustrating for some of our clinical partners, but what we got to do is when we get it, we need to give it and just get ready for the next, the next amount of vaccine that's going to be made available to us. Do, do you see that after a couple of weeks? I mean, do, do you see, you know, obviously the president has said he wants to get 100 million shots in the first 100 days. I mean, do you see there being some exponential ramp up after, after the next month or two? You know, that's, that's the real challenge is because we don't see a lot of mechanisms to increase the vaccine supply. If you look at getting our vaccine out, I mean, we're doing a really good job with what we get. Um, even our clinical partners of the first doses they received, 84% have been given so far. And then, you know, we're, we're do about the same, you know, pretty quickly with the drive through clinics. So um, it's really a vaccine supply issue. And if they can increase the number of vaccine, I mean, a lot of this Defense Production Act conversations have been around syringes and stuff like that. Um, but what we really need is just more vaccine. And, and I don't see that that can, that can sort of double or triple any time in the near future. Okay. All right. So uh, second question, when will teachers be able to, when will their turn be in the line? So we, we had a pretty dramatic shift in strategy. Um, we had followed the CDC guidance initially to do uh, nursing homes and healthcare. And then we're going to do um, 75 and older and essential frontline workers like teachers. But a couple of weeks ago, there was a sort of a shift. And, and not that it's a bad strategy, but it's just, it's a little bit, um, upending people's expectations where we put the 65 and older and medical issues ahead of these frontline essential workers. Um, and there's a reason for that, but still it's, it's difficult for folks who are anticipating it. But after this current level where we are as far as 65 and older and those with serious medical issues, then we anticipate it's going to be people with um, who are frontline essential workers like policemen, firemen, teachers, that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, even if you've had COVID, mm -hmm. mild or strong case, why should you get the vaccine and, and how long should you wait after you've had COVID to get the vaccine? Yeah, yeah great question. Um, yes, you should get the vaccine. Um, we know that people can get COVID again after they've had it. Usually it's after 90 days. So if it's been 90 days since you've had COVID, we definitely recommend you getting it when it's your turn, right? When it's time for you to get it. Uh, it does boost your immunity and it looks like the vaccine protection may be, may be pretty long. And sometimes vaccine protection is even better than the virus. It sounds kind of strange, but sometimes that does happen. Uh, but if you've had COVID, you need to wait until you feel better and are well over the illness before you get it. I recommend at least a few weeks, just because if you get it pretty soon, it'll make you feel pretty crummy. Um, if you've had COVID before and you get the vaccine, it will make you feel bad because your immune system is going to ramp up. So just please be aware of that. Um, but you have up to 90 days after infection before you would really need to be uh, that concerned about getting the vaccine. So it's a few weeks after or, but, but don't wait past 90 days then. Yeah, yeah, if you're, if you're eligible, yes. All right, All right. How, how long does it take after, the, after you get the first shot and the second shot for you to start getting that immunity kicking in? It looks like it's about one or two weeks after the vaccine. So about a week or two after your second vaccine is when you really start to show the full sort of robust 95% protection. All right. Um, can people still, or do we know yet, can people still carry the virus and transmit to others even if they've been vaccinated? We don't know for sure. Um, there's some early evidence that maybe that would be less likely, but until we know for sure, you know, that's one of the reasons why we still think the masking thing is so important, even if you've been vaccinated. All right. is, is the second strain that we're seeing in other states and other countries, the, the, the variant, is that becoming a problem in Mississippi? And, and does the vaccine still protect against this strain? And this strain is just more, just, it's easier to catch or how does it work? Yeah, so the other strains that we've seen are more contagious. Um, they have a stronger binding affinity for the receptor on your cells. So basically it just takes a smaller dose to, to get you sick. 
Um, we haven't seen any in Mississippi yet. We are, we are looking. Um, it doesn't mean it's not here, but it's probably not widespread, but it probably will be here. And we do think the vaccine should still be fully effective against it based on current information. All right. How long do you think immunity will last once someone has received their, 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 their received both shots? Do you think that this will be something that we have to get every year for going forward? Um, you know, it looks like the immunity la should last pretty long, maybe a year or so. I mean, of course, we don't know absolutely because people haven't had it that long, but some of the evidence suggests that you should have a pretty long-standing immune response. I think whether or not you're going to need a second or ongoing shots just depends on how does the virus itself change over time? Does it mutate in a way that the vaccine is not as effective? The coronaviruses as a class of viruses don't mutate quite as readily as flu, so there'd be some hope that you this wouldn't be a recurring annual thing but there's a pretty decent chance that we'll have to go through more than one iteration of this. All right. uh, this is the, the second dose of the vaccine we've heard is a little bit uh, tougher in terms of side effects than the first. Is, is there a reason, like a medical reason for that? It's, uh, it's your immune system. And so the first time you get it, your body's kind of figured it out and uh, setting up your immune response. But then the second time you get it, your immune system's already primed. It's almost like it's sitting on the starting block and it kind of kicks off a lot more aggressively. So the symptoms you get, are from the inflammatory chemicals in your body when your immune system reacts to the vaccine. Are there any medications that or health conditions that people should consider if they're wondering whether they get the vaccine or not? For example, uh, if you're pregnant or breastfeeding, I mean, is it okay for you to get the vaccine? It, it is. Now, we, we do recommend that if you get if you are um, pregnant, that you talk to your OBGYN first. I mean, it is supported, but we just want pregnant women to have the full opportunity to have a conversation because it hasn't not been extensively studied in pregnant women. Um, as far as other medical conditions, well, breastfeeding, breastfeeding should be fine. Um, there's nothing that indicates that that would be problematic. Um, but as far as other conditions, if you have had a history of anaphylaxis, especially to a medication, and basically if you had such a severe reaction that you passed out and had to go to the emergency room, or if you carry an EpiPen around, we do want you to get the vaccine in a clinical setting just so you can have the full complement of services. It does happen rarely. Um, we haven't seen it in Mississippi yet. I'm not a, we've seen several sort of skin rashes related to vaccine out of the you know 200,000 doses we've given 200,000 doses so um, but if you have if you're on medications that alter your immune system there are a, a small number of drugs like for uh, lupus or rheumatoid arthritis that might alter the effectiveness of the vaccine and you may want to talk to your doctor but you wouldn't have a severe medical reaction to that no no not okay. not because of that no sir all right uh is it important, and we sort of touched on this earlier, until a critical mass of people have been vaccinated and for people to keep wearing masks and practice social distancing? Y yes, you know, it's gonna make such a difference. We're starting to see a decline in cases, although we still have a bunch. You know, we've already had more than a thousand deaths in January in Mississippi. That's a thousand people who, who did not have to die. If we wanna prevent deaths and open schools and get back to normal, we need a combination of masks, social distance, and vaccine for a good two or three months before we right. can really expect to get more normal. Okay, any last thoughts in terms of where, where we are as a state on this and, and what you would advise people out there to, to do going forward? And I mean, do you kind of see in your mind what a timeline might be for, for normalcy to return? Yeah, um, so you know, just, just be patient. We've got a little ways to go. We, we see positive trends in the future, but they'll be more positive more quickly if we can do simple stuff. You know, get vaccinated when it's your turn, and then you know, wear masks in public and avoid social gatherings. Social gatherings are the biggest thing that are killing us. Um, whenever we're working up an outbreak, people will tell me, hey, you know, I wear a mask when I go to the grocery store and I wear a mask at work. And I said, well, when's the last time you went to dinner? Oh yeah, you know, I went out with my friends to the restaurant and you know, we, had a, we had a couple of beers. And you know, it, it, the, the virus doesn't care why you took your mask off or why you're breathing around people who are not in your household. It just finds that as an opportunity. So, Please just be real careful with your social events. Um, if we can be really, really diligent for the next couple of months, we might get to a pretty normal situation coming into summer. All right. Hey, again, thank you for joining us today and uh, appreciate the work that you do and, um, and just stay safe and all the best to you. No, no, thank you, Mayor, and really appreciate the great partnership with City of Hattiesburg. Y'all have been fantastic. We appreciate Dr. Dobbs uh, lending us his time in that conversation. Uh, I want to remind you that Saturday and Sunday this weekend, there is a mask and hand sanitizer giveaway at the Forest County Emergency Management Office. Uh, that's at 4080 Highway 11 near Sully's. 
Uh, if you know someone who is disabled or just can't get out to pick up masks or hand sanitizer, they can call 601-544-5911 and they will deliver one to them. But again, we thank Glenn and his folks at Emergency Management for making this mask and hand sanitizer giveaway possible. Some city news for you. This morning, we cut the ribbon on a new, new spur to the Longleaf Trace. Uh, this spur goes from the Longleaf Trace uh, at East 4th Street all the way over to the 6th Street Museum District. This connects the Trace, which of course is one of our city's uh, more higher profile tourism elements to the African American Military History Museum, Eureka School, C.E. Roy Community Center, uh, the soon-to-be Osceola McCarty House that's going to be open, as well as the uh, Old Smith Drug and in the heart of the Mobile Bowie neighborhood. And so to make this connection between sort of points of tourism uh, is a real plus for us. And we certainly thank um, the Hattiesburg Convention Commission for helping sponsor and pay for this project. And so we encourage you when you're down downtown, uh, just swing by, take the trail and, and see what's, what's all there. We appreciate also uh, Representative Percy Watson, who was there to help cut the ribbon. Uh, he was so instrumental in getting the money for the previous phase that took the trace from North Main Street to the train depot, uh, as well as uh, City Council and Mary Dryden and, and other members of the Hattiesburg Convention Commission. As we go into the weekend, remember to wash your hands, take care of yourself mentally and physically. Please wear a mask if you go out in public. Do only what is essential and remember, you're safer at home. Have a great weekend.